Okay, so now you know um, a lot about how Old English nouns work, um, and in particular, you know how the nominative works and the accusative. Okay, the nominative is the form that the subject of a sentence takes, the thing that does the verb. The accusative is the form that the object of the sentence takes, the thing that the verb is done to. Winner. Two more cases to go, and uh, pretty much only two. Um, so that's cool. Um, we have the genitive and the dative. Hopefully you've got them noted down, because um, like I say, we'll be using these words a lot. Um, what's the genitive for? Um, again, I'll refer to modern English. In, in modern English, we've got two ways of doing what the genitive does in Old English. Um, genitive basically indicates possession. There are kind of areas where that kind of definition gets a bit creaky, but basically genitive indicates possession. And there are really two ways to do it in modern English. You can say Alaric's walrus, or you can say, um, oh, I don't know, the tail of the walrus. I like walruses. Um, in Alaric's walrus, we put an ending on the end of the noun that does the possessing. Alaric's walrus, who's possessing the walrus? Alaric possesses the walrus. People quite often get confused about which of these two should have the ending on, even though in modern English we do this all the time automatically. Um, but you put an ending on the word that does the possessing, that does the owning, um, and, and that shows that it owns the other, other noun. Um, Alaric's walrus. And Old English does this a lot. Um, and that apostrophe S in fact corresponds to an Old English ending, which is ES, uh, and you see that all over the place. You, I don't know what, let's invent an Old English form of Alaric. Alriches. Alrich, that's me. Alriches, that's something that belongs to me. Alriches. Wow, cross, or whatever it is in Old English, I've forgotten walrus. Um, in modern English, though, we also have another way of forming the genitive, which is to use of, the tail of the walrus. Um, and we use that in kind of slightly broader, weirder circumstances too, like one of the boys, one of my students. Um, both of those two different ways of doing the genitive are subsumed in Old English under the genitive ending. Endings of words that work a bit like that apostrophe s in English. So rather than saying a room full of students, uh, you would say um, a, a, a room students full. A room students s apostrophe full. May not be a useful example. Don't worry, you'll get lots of opportunity to practice uh, crazy genitives when you're looking at Old English texts. But that's what genitives are, they're possessives. They show that a noun with the genitive ending owns another noun, and it corresponds to apostrophe S in English, or S apostrophe, and it corresponds to of. Done, that's a genitive, winner. Um, anything else I want to add on the subject of genitives? Not for now, though you'll find some other kind of crazy stuff that genitives gets, get up to when, when you're actually reading Old English texts. Um, let's instead, think about the dative. So we're nearly there. What's the dative for? Well, this is a bit harder to explain. Those of you who are kind of syntactically trained um, might find it useful to be told that it's for indirect objects of verbs. Alaric, subject, gave, verb. Alaric gave the letter, object. Alaric gave the letter to Bernard where to Bernard is the indirect, well Bernard is the indirect object. Some of you are kind of comfortable with that terminology and you might find that useful. Datives are often used for what you might call indirect objects. Um, for those of you who are scared by that terminology, don't worry, there's another way of thinking about them which is much kind of easier for modern English speakers and works almost all the time. Um, datives are used after or instead of a preposition. What's a preposition? Prepositions are those little words 
that tell you the position of things. Preposition tell you, or a preposition tells you the position. So it's easy to remember. Um, the position of something in space or in time. So words like on, in, off, over, through, after, before, around, those little words that sort of tell you where things are, prepositions. And in Old English, if you have a preposition, then you've got a pretty good chance that the word after it will be in the dative. There are some exceptions, we can investigate that in due course. But you can just think of it as being datives come after a preposition. Um, or instead of a preposition. So I can say, um, I sent an email to Bernard Fine. Well, in Old English, if you're a poet, you could say something like, if you were going to send an email in Old English, to Bernarda, where that would be our dative ending on the end, that E. Why is it dative? Because it's after a preposition. Or you could actually just say, I sent an email, Bernarda, where the listener goes, hang on, that noun's got an E on the end. Well, ooh. Nouns in that category only have an E on the end when they're the dative. Ah, so this must be being used instead of a preposition. He must have sent the email to Bernard, because he wouldn't have sent the email over Bernard, or after Bernard, or around Bernard. So, datives get used after prepositions, but they can also get used, and particularly in Old English poetry, instead of a preposition. And you just have to guess from the context what the most appropriate preposition is going to be. Again, that might sound pretty crazy in the abstract, um, and it's quite hard to parallel that closely in modern English, I'm afraid. But you'll get used to it pretty quickly, as long as you kind of learn to look at the endings of these nouns and to spot a dative when you see one. Don't want to say anything else on the subject of datives and, and indeed genitives. Just a couple of things. Yeah, cool. Um, I've mentioned already that we have this apostrophe S in English which corresponds to ES in some Old English nouns. That's an ending that's going to be pretty easy to spot. If you see an Old English noun with ES on the end, you'll be like, whoa, that must be a genitive. There's no way that that could be the subject of the sentence. There's no way it could be the object of the sentence. It must be possessing another noun. So that's kind of handy. Um, there are a couple of other consistent features, though. If you have a look at your magic sheet, nouns, normative, accusative, genitive, dative, singular, and then you get nominative, nominative, accusative, genitive, and dative, plural. And if you look across the genitive plurals on your magic sheet, you'll find that they all end in A. Barter, shipper, thinger, shinner, glover, etc., etc., etc. I want you to repeat this out loud. All genitive plurals end in A. All genitive plurals end in A. Repeat after me. All genitive plurals end in A. Right, pause it, say it again a few times. I never want to, anyone ever to forget this fact because it's really useful. Admittedly, other things end in A too. So if you see a word ending or a noun ending with an A, it's not always a genitive plural, but it's a pretty good chance that it will be. It's a good place to start looking. All genitive plurals end in A. And there's another cool thing on the magic sheet too, if you look at your nouns. Down to your plurals, down below the genitives, down to the datives, you'll see that all dative plurals end in um. Bartum, shipum. Thingum, shinum, glovum, namum, etc. All. Yes, you're going to have to repeat this too. All dative plurals end in. Um. Easy to remember. All genitive plurals end in a. All dative plurals end in um. Never forget it. And that will be really useful. As soon as you see someone saying, you know, a sentence says, Bernard gave some letters, and then it will say something like, oh, I don't know, mannum.